On today's Two On Your Side Town Hall, dealing with the Delta variant, the concerns here in western New York and around the country with the faster spreading version of COVID. Plus, boosting financial aid, some advice for parents and students on getting a little more help from the colleges themselves. And how does the law deal with hazing? The Verify team takes a look at a simple question and finds a really complicated answer. And we thank you for joining us on the Town Hall tonight. I'm Kate Wellshofer. Michael has the night off, and we're going to talk tonight about the COVID situation, something that's been really good recently compared to what we've seen over the last year. The current rolling average of the percent positive in Erie County is half a percent, and the seven day total of new cases per 100,000 residents is 7.5. So both of those are really low numbers, but still, they have been increasing over the last week. Niagara County's numbers are very similar and have also been increasing from where they were. And the numbers tell one story, but we want to make sure all of this is in perspective for you. And here to help us do that, Dr. Nancy Nielsen. She's the Senior Associate Dean for Health Policy at UB's Medical School, and she joins us live tonight. Dr. Nielsen, thanks for being here. Thank you for inviting me, Kate. So what's your assessment of the current COVID numbers in Western New York and, and what do we take away from it? Because obviously, even if the numbers are relatively low, we don't want to see a continued increase in cases. Is this just to be expected in a population where not everybody is vaccinated? That is what's to be expected, especially now that the Delta variant we know is so much more contagious than the earlier variants. So if you're unvaccinated, I guess the only thing I, I worry about people who are unvaccinated, and I guess all I could say is, you know, this virus is coming for you. Uh, so I, I, please rethink that if you possibly can, because the vaccines are very effective against the Delta variant right now. And if the virus continues to circulate among people who are, are not immune, then what's going to happen is the virus is going to continue to mutate and then we're not so sure about the efficacy of the vaccine. So it's really important. Yeah, what do we need to know about the Delta variant here in Western New York? Because the headlines regarding it are certainly scary. Now we see this rise in cases. So what is the reality here? Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, I, I've talked to the people that run the Genomic Institute who actually do the sequencing of the virus. Uh, they found the Delta variant here from early May. Then the mid-May samples uh, didn't show any. I haven't heard anything back in the last week, so I don't know if the Delta variant is here, but I think we have to assume that it is because it is doubling about every two weeks throughout the country and it will soon be the dominant strain in the country just and we know that simply because it's so infectious so that's going to happen and and that worries us it really worries us for people who are unvaccinated or for people who are immunocompromised but vaccinated because their immune response is not quite as strong we want to touch a little bit on masks a bit tonight as well because even though they're no longer required by the state are there situations that you think people should still be wearing them, knowing that they're recommended for people who are not vaccinated? But what about people who are vaccinated? Are they good or are there times that they might still want to mask up given the current situation? Well, I think you still have to on mass transit and you have to when you go into a medical facility. So that still remains in place. But prudence would dictate that even a vaccinated person if you're gonna be in a crowded situation where you really don't know who's vaccinated and who's not, nobody's checking, you might wanna think about it. Uh, if you're outdoors, you probably don't have to worry, but if you're indoors in a crowd, um, you might wanna think about wearing a mask. And as it, as it has tonight, so often our conversations about what to do and what's next comes back to vaccines. And yesterday we officially missed the president's goal of getting 70% of American adults at least one vaccine dose. Do we have a sense right now of the biggest obstacle of getting more people vaccinated? Well, I think at this point, it's it's people's belief system, whatever, based on whatever that is. And you don't talk people out of that. Uh, we just hope, I, I hope and pray that they uh, they pay attention, 
to what's happening. We've lost 600,000 people in this country. The numbers are going up, although they're very low in our region, thank goodness. And it really does feel like we've gotten back to some semblance of normal, doesn't it? Uh, it feels very good, but I think we shouldn't be sanguine about this. Uh, I, we know that kids uh, haven't yet been vaccinated. Young kids haven't yet been vaccinated. So we have to be careful about them. They should be wearing masks if they're indoors. If they're outdoors, no, you don't need it. And we talked in the last half hour about a new study uh, that found Ohio's million dollar lottery for people to get vaccinated just didn't work. They said that it shows that money could be better spent on targeting hesitancy. New York tried similar things with lottery tickets and a SUNY scholarship lottery. What should we be doing or are there other things that we could be doing? Or like you said, is it people that have just decided they're not going to get vaccinated and is that going to be too much to overcome? I don't think it's too much because there are still some who are reluctant, not totally opposed, but reluctant. Erie County Health Department is, is doing a very novel approach. I talked with Dr. Burstein today. Erie County is contracting with, uh, with community health workers who are from the community, who will go door to door and talk to people. These are people they know in communities where they live and they will answer questions and then and then figure out where the best place several days later is to bring the vaccine. So I think that approach, which meets people where they are, not preaching at them, not haranguing them, not shaming them, but saying, I'm worried about you. I don't want you to get sick. L let's talk. Uh, I, that, that I think is probably what's going to happen. People listen to trusted voices and those voices are people that they know. Also people that they trust like their clergy, their physician. Uh, hopefully that dialogue is, uh, is a productive one. The conversation continues with a voice that we certainly trust here. Dr. Nancy Nielsen, thanks again for joining us tonight. Thank you, Kate. Well, also tonight, COVID gave a real hit to families' finances, and that means more trouble paying for college. But at the same time, colleges and universities are trying to grow their enrollments, which means there may be more opportunities to negotiate for financial aid. CNBC's Sharon Epperson has more on how to make the ask and takes a look at one family's successful appeal. I clicked the link and it said, congratulations, you are a member of the Fairfield class of 2025. Julia Hall was accepted to her top college choice. And what was most exciting? I had gotten into the nursing program and gotten the merit scholarship. Helping offset her $52,000 tuition as a full-time undergrad at Fairfield University. How much did it cover for the overall cost of attendance? So it covers around 30%. Even with the scholarship, the Hall family worried they may have trouble covering the rest, and they did not qualify for any need-based aid. Once they make a decision to commit to a student, they'll do anything to keep that student. After meeting with a college funding consultant, Tom and his wife Lauren followed advice on how to officially appeal for more money. We made sure that we enclosed some of the letters of merit scholarship that she had for acceptances. We showed that we had some leverage. We asked for what I felt was a moderate appeal. We said our excitement level is very real. If you could help us in this area, that we'd be willing to commit. And it worked. How much more aid were you able to get? We got around 3% more. Before the pandemic, about one third of appeals were successful at most schools. And the team at Princeton Review says that number has likely grown. Schools weathered some hard times in fall of 2020, but that doesn't mean they can't remain active and aggressive with a financial aid and scholarship policy for those students that are coming into classes this year. Financial aid decisions made for this incoming freshman class are based on federal income tax returns from 2019. In asking for more need-based aid, experts say be transparent about how your family's income and expenses have changed since then. Be very specific, be very to the point why you cannot afford the college you're trying to get into. And if you're not successful the first time, don't be discouraged. There's always a next year there's always future instances in which you will need to negotiate for financial aid. There's still hope. If a student gets additional aid, make sure to clarify whether it's renewable or not. Typically, you need to apply for need-based aid every year. Meanwhile, scholarship money tends to be renewable as long as you maintain a certain GPA and credit load. For CNBC, I'm Sharon Epperson.